everyone. I'm the person standing between you and lunch, so let's get to start it. Um, very quick, um, who am I? So I work with uh, Deutsche Telekom Security for about two years now. Um, but other than that, I come from a kind of research background, have worked at university for several years in the area of like uh, network and IT security research. And right now, my main focus is uh, threat actor research and malware analysis, and especially in the area of cybercrime. What I'm going to talk about today is kind of like an attempt to get a, a big picture understanding of uh, a threat actor named TA-577, which is, uh, I think, quite popular. Some people might have heard about it. And um, I'm going to start with like um, describing a little bit the history over the last uh, two or three years. I'm going to very quickly talk about um, the malware, but this is, this is not a malware-centric talk. Um, we had great talks about iStudy in the morning. I think there's another talk about Peak about coming up, so I'm going to keep this really brief, just one slide. Um, so what I really want to talk about is like how does this actor get uh, so many high volume campaigns running, uh, what they do they do on the web-based front, what do they do for the uh, email spam distribution, and what can we learn from that, basically. And yeah, finally, I'm going to uh, conclude and give some, some recommendations as well. So let's look a little bit at the, at the history, starting up with uh, a little bit of, of quick facts. So we know that this actor is probably active for uh, over 15 years, so quite an experienced uh, threat actor. We also see that they are very versatile. Only in the last year they had four different initial access malwares. Um, and um, like I already said, they launched very powerful campaigns. We have seen in the last year campaigns where they had over 200 different domains where they distributed their malware. And yeah, why do they do this? Basically to earn a lot of money. Um, we don't do like a cryptocurrency tracking, so I never attempted like to, to uh, get an exact figure, but I'm sure it's worth doing it. <laughs> and uh, so with that, let's, let's jump into a little bit of, of history lesson. Um, so um, first fact that I'm uh, pointing out here is the tram persona, which was discovered through the Conti leaks. I'm sure a lot of you people are familiar with that. So Trump was um, within the Conti organization. He was kind of a team leader. He was um, like coordinating negotiations with uh, ransomware victims. He was also distributing money within um, his team. So he was quite an um, important figure in that, uh, in that uh, organization. But also, we could see already in November 21 to uh, these uh, leaked chat logs, that he was kind of unhappy with the way things went, with the infrastructure, with the software that they used, and he expressed uh, the desire to create basically his own um, ransomware program to um, create own software, basically. And um, we will see where this is going in the next slides. And um, one important thing that I also added here just for completeness, in, in December 2021, there was a really clear tie between this tram persona and the Quackbot botnet. He asked another member of the, um, of the Conti group uh, to crypt a sample named Stager 1 TR DLL. I think uh, some of you might be familiar with the Quackbot TR botnet. Um, this actor also called for this reason uh, the TR distro actor by some groups. And uh, so there's uh, also really clear tied to this uh, organization, this botnet. Yeah, then in February 2022, a lot of things suddenly happened. He asked uh, the same person to crypt another malware sample. sample. This time he, he said it is a new locker. So we might guess that this is what they have been working on during the last months after they said they are no longer really happy with uh, what Conti is doing. And at the same point in time, he also basically dispensed the cooperation with affiliates within the Conti group, which is kind of interesting. Like, this is the point where he likely switched to running his own kind of stuff. And we can see that now. Starting March 2022, there was a new Quackbot botnet. Uh, first, it was called AA. Then later on, they um, switched basically to naming it BB, BB01, and so on. And we have seen in many incidents that this correlated with later on uh, follow-up activities leading to blackbuster incidents. And um, in fact, many believe that BB is just an acronym for blackbuster. 
Um, and no long after that, like only one month later, um, Blackbuster was first seen posting victims to their leaked blog. And they didn't start slow. In, in fact, they had over 10 victims on their blog only in the first month. And I want you to keep note of this um, time correlation. Like in March 2022, the malware got active. April 2022, um, the ransomware group is active. We will see that kind of time difference multiple times now. And they basically continued um, doing this for most of 2022. In December, they uh, decided to basically do a break, which is also quite typical for this actor, that every now and then they take a break. And usually when they do it, they do it to, to develop something else, something that they come up after the break, some new maybe infection chain, some new malware maybe. And this time, apparently, it was a new malware because in February 2023, we first saw the PikaBot malware. And um, we have proof that it was distributed through the, through the same channels as the QuackBot BB botnet with a lot of overlaps in indicators where we have seen um, attacks going on. And then, keep in mind, February 2023, malware, uh, malware spamming is resumed. And March, April 2023, Blackbuster resumes like posting victims to their blog, likely as a consequence of resumed QuackBot and PeakBot attacks. Then um, I think also yesterday in the evening, we cheered a little bit about the uh, QuackBot botnet takedown. A lot of people keep, uh, kept asking me at this time, like, yeah, OK, um, are we done now? Like, do they stop? And I was like, nah, they're going to be back. And for sure, they were back in, in September 2023, just kept using PikaBot. They had already like prepared this new malware. And um, now they don't use QuackBot anymore and just use another malware. But otherwise, continue what they have been doing for a long time. And um, once again, September 2023, the malware gets active. October 2023, after some period of inactivity, Blackbuster continues posting victims. So likely not a coincidence. And so, so we see in, in summary that there's a lot of correlation between um, PikaBot, between Blackbuster, and the affiliation to QuackBot as well. Um, and all can be tied to activities of TA577. We're not the only people um, who have noticed this, of course. There's uh, reports by Proofpoint, by Trend Micro, IBM X-Force, also others. Um, don't want to read it all, but basically they're also saying like um, overlaps between QBot, Blackbuster, um, PikaBot, um, also IBM, for example. They analyzed the code of PikaBot, saw similarities to code that was already used by, before in cryptors of the, Black, uh, of the Blackbuster group. So yeah. Kind of also not a coincidence, as I think. So, um, yeah, a lot of things that um, indicate that um, this might be just one actor. Let's look a little bit more into the malware, but as I said, I will keep this really brief, just like mentioning um, it for completeness. Um, I think there have been plenty of talks about QuackBot at this conference, so um, it's a really old malware. Um, has been intercepted by law enforcement last year. We have seen it coming back in December, but so far we think it's not playing a major role right now, but um, should keep an eye out for that. PikaBot, um, at least in our assessment, seems to be the new go-to malware for TA577. We have seen it a lot since uh, September last year, and uh, basically continuing until the present date. Last week's is rather low activity, but I'm sure they will continue spreading it. And uh, PikaBot also, yeah, it's a very advanced uh, malware initially when it was first seen. We really uh, had a hard time even getting it to run in sandboxes and stuff. So it's quite interesting. Um, occasionally, TA577 has dropped uh, iced ID as well via the same channels, basically, as um, the other payloads that they use. Um, we don't have a good explanation why they are doing this, why they are requiring this other malware. Um, our working theory is that maybe they are doing this uh, like an, as a service model, like renting out their distribution infrastructure to some other actor to distribute iStudy. 
would love to hear maybe um, some theories that uh, you have about this. Um, so well, if you have a good idea or even some, some proof, like some overlap in, in infrastructure, then yeah, please get in touch. And then also briefly last year we saw Darkgate. So Darkgate got very popular in summer 2023. Um, we also analyzed it, um, posted on our blog about it. And um, we saw TA577 shortly basically just testing this server. But other than that, they did, never used it again. So basically, I, I think they were just trying out if, if it's an option and then chose not to continue with that. OK, so, so we know they are using all these malwares. But how do they actually get the malwares to the victims? That was the question that we were really um, trying to answer to better understand like also how can we protect from that. So we found out that cPanel, which is kind of like a web-based server administration framework, is playing a crucial role in the malware distribution system. Um, in every campaign, and they launch multiple campaigns per week if they are on, on a period of high activity, they had like campaigns with numerous URLs spanning a lot of servers. And we are basically asking ourselves, OK, how are they keeping up this, this high volume, this high amount of servers? How are they even getting access to, to such a number of servers? And we also quickly noticed like um, the affected hosts also contain legitimate content. So it's not an infrastructure that is purely set up for, mal for malicious purposes. And in, I like, would say, 100% of cases where we checked, cPanel was on that host. So first we thought like, okay, they must have some exploit maybe and just go around and pwn all the devices. And uh, we were able to, to get hold of a log um, of one of the affected servers. And we could not really find any, any activity that would hint that the server was exploited in some way. Uh, what we saw instead is just files kept appearing, not only uploaded from TA577, but also from likely other threat actors. And they appeared like as they were just legitimately uploaded via FTP or some other uh, means. So um, that led us to the theory that they are just using like valid credentials to log onto the cPanel and then just upload files. And um, what we did is basically we um, pulled uh, different sets of leaked credentials which um, are available on the darknet for cPanel. So there's a lot of forums uh, offering cPanel credentials. And we saw, we did not do like a systematic analysis, but we saw like a lot of overlap between um, the people that were posting leaks and then subsequent uh, malicious activity, including TA-577, within a really close time frame. So what do they do, actually, when they um, uh, infiltrate such a server? So first thing they do is put their web shell. I I'm sure that um, some of you might have seen that. It's not, not a newly discovered asset. It's known for several years now. Um, basically, what it does, it's just a simple uploader. So have, they have reduced like the number of available functions over the years. It was before like having more features. And nowadays, the only uh, things that you can do with a web shell is create a directory and upload a file to a directory, which is basically everything that they need to do. Um, they um, password protected with a random hash K. So for every um, server which they infiltrate, um, there's a unique hash. And if you don't know it, you cannot use the web shell, basically. And um, in the past, it could be easily discovered just um, using, using the root uh, URL or the root domain of the, of the web server and appending slash UPLPHP. And if it was there, basically, that was a prime asset to say, OK, TA577 is running some campaigns on this server. Um, sadly, they might have noticed that people were tracking in them in this way. And so last year, they started um, changing. And they basically renamed the shell to a uh, number of random digits.php. And every, on every server, obviously, choosing a different name. So. Um, you might even be able to make it out on the screenshot on the right, although it's quite small. We even saw servers where they um, basically pwned the server two times. 
first time they uploaded their old UPL PHP, and then like some weeks later they come back like dropping the variant with the random digits.php. I don't know for what reason. Uh, but uh, we have seen that on, on multiple servers. Um, there's still ways to find the web shell, but I'm not going to disclose it in uh, TLP Clear. But if you want to know, come talk to me. Um, so, so this is the, the first thing that they do, but then how do they actually distribute the malware? Do they simply put the malware on the servers? No. They have um, tried to not do this in, in most cases, um, I think because they like, don't want to give away that much um, on a server that they don't own, basically. So what they put instead is kind of a, a PHP-based proxy script. And what that does is basically it collects some information about the victim on each request and proxies it to a tier two infrastructure. And um, this tier two server seems to do some like uh, checks, um, like geofencing or also anti-analysis based on the provided values. Um, for example, within our sandboxes, we almost never get a payload back from these servers. And um, yeah, if you if you know like uh, what values to provide, you can you can um, get a payload. But really, it's decided upon each request. So there's some mechanism in this uh, tier two server to decide whether or not the, this victim is actually worth giving a payload uh, out uh, to it. And uh, surprisingly, these uh, tier two servers um, they last quite a long time. They are hard coded in this file, and we have seen. Uh, one single IP like being maintained for multiple months without like uh, someone taking action. Um, at some point in time they change it and then they run it again for several months. And on these, uh, on these backend servers they also seem to have a lot of PHP scripts. So PHP seems to be like their tool of choice for, for server side uh, stuff. We have seen uh, documents like router08.php, router underscore uh, black dot php kvs php and also i think some some others that we have seen infrequently and also we noticed that there is some sort of uh, authentication mechanism like uh, the the backend server the tier 2 server checking if the request is actually coming from a valid um pwned tier 1 server and um we also thinking like um, this could be a cool like uh, tracking mechanism, like talking to this tier two server, but um, this kind of authentication makes it a little bit difficult. So we're still uh, looking for for good ideas um, how to do this. So um, how does it look like them operating on such a phone server? Here's uh, an excerpt of um, of some of the, the logs that we analyzed. Um, I redacted some of the values because we're doing this TLP clear. Um, so uh, we can see clear patterns here. There's always like three requests, two posts to the UPL PHP, likely like the make directory, and then the second request is the actual upload. And then like shortly after that, like only seconds or some minutes after that, um, another IP comes and checks if the download is working. Basically, like they're validating if the, if the script is working, if it's returning a payload. And this pattern repeats like for every time they create a new, um, a new proxy script on the, on the server. And what's very interesting is, it's always like one IP um, does the, the make there and the upload, and then there's another IP checking. And um, after we observed this for some time, we noticed like the same IP came back. So the same IP that initially like uploaded the proxy script, in the end came back checking on another IP that uploaded a proxy script. So it's very likely that this is uh, just part of botnet, um, which is uh, used as a proxy to basically talk to these servers. And also one indication of that is always the same user agent, no matter which IP is coming. So likely these are just proxies uh, for, for whoever is uh, behind that. So and we kept looking at this, uh, at this specific IP. And now we're pivoting basically to the malware spam distribution because like now, we are, now the actor is able to, 
to basically distribute malware, but how does he actually get the malware to, to the victims? And um, their prime method is just malware spam. And we kept looking at this, this one IP, and on VirusTotal, interestingly, we found two email samples associated with this IP. And when we looked at those, uh, we saw in the headers that actually the same IP that was um, uploading the, the proxy scripts and then later on checking on another proxy script if the, if the payload download is working was actually also spamming. And um, it was spamming also very interestingly to a server that is also running cPanel. Like cPanel is not only like a web server administration tool but also has a complete mail server built in. And we also noticed like in the spam emails that we observed, it was almost always like um, servers that were running cPanel. And le that leads us to the conclusion that the actor is basically using the clients of likely botnet hosts as a proxy to do whatever they do on the client side. And the servers, basically they use cPanel for the web-based malware distribution and also for their kind of spamming operation. And very interestingly also from these two emails, we could clearly attribute it to a certain campaign that was conducted by TA577, and it was in this case the BB30 and BB32 Quackbot uh, botnet campaigns. So how, how does their mail spam typically look like? Um, maybe there's some people here in the room familiar with it. Um, so I will go over that quite briefly. So what they always do is like um, uh, reply chain hijacking. So they use some previously existing mail conversation, which they have stolen um, in some way, and then kind of look, make their email look like a reply to this. And um, we spotted that there is some very characteristic items in their emails. So uh, one thing is that they keep using like um, doubled or omitted um, letters in the subject, in the sender name, and also in the email body. This started someplace in, in last year, I don't know exact time, but before that we, we saw always for the emails that we are getting, we saw always the sender name telecom. And uh, that was obviously very easy to filter out, like a sender name telecom, and the domain was nothing like related to official telecom domains. And likely they noticed like, okay, yeah, people have no difficulties filtering out these emails, and so they are trying to tr look, make it look still like the, the actual victim name, but like doing some permutations. But then also like, yeah, there's a limited number of permutations, so your query just gets a little bit longer, maybe. <laughs> um, then a very interesting thing also, which they started like some months ago, um, they were using quite old emails in some cases to, to make their kind of reply. And a lot of people, like even non-technical people spotted like, yeah, this is really old communication, like what's going on here? And so they kept changing um, since some months the, the year values in these uh, emails. And now we're getting emails from the future. <laughs> so we have in this email, for example, the, the, the uh, 12th of May, and, and down there, the 11th of May, 2024, so cool email from the future. Thanks for that. And uh, also, they have a hard time with the German umlauts, so given that they mostly communicate in Kyrillic, I find that a little surprising that they likely have went through the, the pain of different encodings but still don't get the German umlauts right. I don't know. And what they really love is the lorem ipsum names. Um, so, so we have seen that like numerous times. Um, so the, the attachment name, for example, here has the term commodi in it. And we've seen them using it in email um, attachments. We see that in URL um, paths and so on. So um, no, I don't know what, why they're doing this, but they seem to be in love with this lorem ipsum text. Okay, so let's look at the conclusion. Um, what have I talked about bef uh, before? So I talked about the actor. So um, TA577 is a really experienced and prolific uh, cybercrime actor. We tie them to the Conti organization and also very closely to uh, Quackbot. Um, we think that they are likely the developers of Pikabot. 
Um, they are likely also the operators, or at least very closely affiliated to the Blackbuster operation. Um, we've seen uh, a lot of changes in the malware landscape of, of what they used last year, like switching from only a Quarkbot to like a bunch of different malwares. Um, and the infrastructure, we show that um, they have a mixture of owned and pwned infrastructure. So the owned infrastructure, basically the tier two, which they don't expose that much. And the, the pwned infrastructure, basically these uh, cPanel systems, which they use for the spamming and also for the web-based distribution. They love PHP scripts to do a lot, lot of stuff. And that's also an excellent way to, to kind of track them. Um, our mission is to, to stop ransomware, and we think a crucial item of that is to stop it just at the beginning, to just stop the initial access. And so I'm go not going to read all that recommendations because I think you are super familiar with that kind of stuff. But really, like, this is where we all should do more. And uh, I want to conclude with this quote, which basically sums it up really good. It's from a book that I'm reading right now. Um, yeah. Basically, uh, we can try to uh, fight them. We can even maybe take down the Quackbot botnet and maybe even arrest people, but they will not stop. And so we need to keep doing what we do. I love con conferences like this where we exchange uh, our findings to make it a little bit harder for the adversaries. And with that, thank you very much. Thank you. We have time for one or two questions. Our lunch effect. Everybody's hungry. <laughs> no question, no lunch. <laughs> you have a question? Do you have a question for yourself? <laughs> a lot, but I can't answer them. <laughs> okay, thank you.